and Elaine introduce herself. And I'm, I'm Elaine Mund. I am the Director of Technical Services in the library. All right, Elaine, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Cool, okay. So we will attempt to get started. If you guys have questions at any time, since it's a pretty small group, I think we can be pretty informal. Feel free to put questions in the chat, uh, raise your hand, um, or just talk. <laughs> I think all of those are fine ways of engaging. We do have time for Q&A at the end, but it, you know, feel free to uh, type up sooner than that as well. All right, so just an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to start talking about a project that Elaine and I uh, participated in the past few months um, to clean up institutional data. So we'll start talking about what institutional scholarship data looks like and the role it plays in rankings um, and the process we went through to identify and improve the accuracy of the scholarship that is attributed to AU and then talk a bit about how that would have affected the rankings had we done this several months ago and then talk about what we'll do in the future. From there, we're going to talk about um, rather than the institutional gathering uh, for an individual researcher, how what author profiles look like when it comes to tracking your scholarship um, and some of the different systems and ways to improve those profiles. Um, we'll conclude with some recommendations for moving forward of how to standardize the information that's collected about yourself and your profiles. And then, as I mentioned, Q&A, and if people want to look at some of these resources that we talk about. Um, we're certainly happy to, to demo any of those as well. All right, so the fun world of counting research data is not as straightforward as it would seem. Um, you would think you publish something and it gets uploaded somewhere, right? And then everybody knows that you've published this thing. However, uh, there is no one place that both tracks everything and tracks it very accurately. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see we have a chart of some of the major um, sources that are used at AU and elsewhere to track scholarship. Um, and you can see that first column uh, scholarship is really diverse. Lots of different fields approach scholarship in different ways and have different methods of communicating with each other. Um, and what is considered scholarship? can be highly discipline specific. So we uh, tend to take a pretty broad approach, right? An inclusive uh, approach to what might be considered scholarship. So some of these things on the list, your department or field may not consider be scholarship, but it might be considered that elsewhere. Um, and then we actually pulled the 2002 data for AU from these four different databases. So elements you guys may know uh, for also sometimes known as FARS or the Faculty Activity Reporting System. Um, all faculty are required to input their scholarship. It's part of the annual merit process, um, which we will be going through very shortly for uh, 2023. But for right now, 2022 is the, the last year that we have more or less complete data of all the faculty putting in all these different types of uh, scholarly engagement that, that they've done over the past year. So you can see there's a lot, right? Almost 3,000 different types of activities that people have engaged with. Um, of those, maybe a quarter of them get tracked by these other sources. Um, so Dimensions, Scopus, and Web of Science are all um, library uh, managed databases that we have access to. So if you went to the library homepage, went to search databases, it's a big alphabetical list of all of our resources and all three of these are on that list. Um, but they don't track all of these different types of resources. So you can see there's a lot of MAs, meaning they don't track that type of content. So it is very incomplete. Um, some of them tend to be more on the, uh, more inclusive of STEM disciplines, less inclusive of journals and other types of outputs in social sciences and arts and humanities. Um, so that's why the numbers are different. Um, not only do they not track different types of inputs, but they don't track every type of input. Um, so you can see even with book chapters, the numbers are very different. 171 versus 68 and 67. That means about 100 of the book chapters that AU produced in 2022 are not with publishers or the uh, metadata wasn't available to give to those databases. So uh, just the, the kind of conceptual framework under which we're operating 
is a little wild. There is no one source where I can go, okay, now I have a complete record of everything. Of these four elements tends to be the most complete, but it also relies a lot on self-reporting, which can introduce some uh, inaccuracies, right? Because people tend to put in their own information in different ways. The uh, benefit of when it gets indexed or added to Dimension Scopus Web of Science is that they tend to be more standardized, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, and each of those databases decides what they want to index or what sources they're going to include. So that also contributes um, to some of these number differences. Um, just a note, you can see the books uh, for 2022. We've got 49 that AU, uh, AU reported having published, which is tremendous and awesome. None of those are in any of these databases because none of them focus on books. They do have some book content, but it is uh, a small, small, small subset of all of the academic books that tend to get published. Um, the place, just so you know, that is not on this list, but is also a major player when it comes to tracking publications is Google, Google Scholar. They do a great job of tracking books, but they can't aggregate it at the institutional level. So that's why it's not on this list. I could look up individual researchers at AU and get their book, book publications, but we can't gather all of it in one spot. Ah, so already a bit of confusion <laughs> probably just on this slide, but the main point is it's messy. Even if we can control all of the metadata that's available, um, it's not all going to be in the same place. All right, um, so how is a publication added to those institution level profiles and all four of those uh, came from um, institutional profiles of pulling together publications at the institution level for AU. Um, so generally what happens is the individual fields, such as the author, the title, the volume and issue, page numbers, uh, the address, which we'll talk more about in great detail, <laughs> is uh, created by the publishers, right? Uh, sometimes it is stuff that the authors themselves have supplied, such as the address and authors field. Um, and sometimes it is supplied by the journal, for example, the issue, the page numbers, the ISSN, which is the uh, number that's assigned to a unique journal. Um, so all of that information is sent from the publisher to one of these databases who then collect it and make it available. However, what information they send and how they send it is not standardized. Every publisher has their own way of doing it. Um, you'll see this especially in Google if you have ever noticed that there sometimes tends to be some missing information when you're looking at Google Scholar search results such as page numbers is often not there and it's because all the different publishers have different ways of formatting this data um, which can affect what is in and is not available. Um, so one of the fields that we have noticed that is particularly lacking in standardization is the address field. So when you have an author, the author is affiliated with an institution. Um, and most of the time, not all of the time, um, some part of the address of that institution is also given so you know who they're associated with. That is what is used to match up a publication with an institution. Um, and it, it's entirely dependent on how do the journals format that address, um, which we'll talk more about a bit later. Um, and then there also can be mistranslation, and we'll actually show you some examples of that in the address field too, but uh, it's not always formatted correctly as it moves through the system. Um, so the database will then take all of that information and they usually run it through an algorithm. So this is not a person is reading every field and manually attaching it. They have an algorithm that's looking for pieces of information and is making a best guess match, essentially. Um, <clears throat> it's not always the way it works, but it tends to be the predominant model that databases use right now. So both for determining when a, pro a publication should match an author and when it should match an institution. They're looking for um, essentially trademarks, right? For example, your entire last name and the same first initial combined with your institutional affiliation will give them a reasonable certainty that you're the same person that you were for previous publications. Um, <clears throat> however, it doesn't always work because it's an automated system. If they don't have enough information to make that match, 
um, what will happen for author information, they will sometimes just create a new author profile. They will assume you're a different person. <laughs> so you may have like 10 of your publications under one author record, but then one, we didn't get enough information and it created a separate record with that one publication. For an institution, it does not do that. So thankfully we do not have hundreds of versions of American University profiles. Instead, it will just not assign it to any institution. So it's just hanging out there kind of in the ether. Um, it's very far less common for it to be misattributed. They have a pretty high threshold for if we have enough information, we will attach it to a university. If we don't have that information, it's not going to get attached. And we'll talk more about that process as well. Whew, sorry, this is a lot. So if you guys have questions, please. Uh, I see that there's some people that have been added since I said it, but we're a fairly small group. Feel free to put questions in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourselves. We'll have a Q&A at the end, but feel free to ask questions in the meantime. Okay, <laughs> so as I mentioned, if there isn't enough information about the institution, it won't get assigned to that institution instead. And uh, what we're gonna be talking about the most is Scopus. Um, but this is an example of what happens instead. They have some suggestions and they'll group together um, publications with similar levels of institutional information for review. <coughs> Excuse me. So I pulled this directly from AU's institutional profile. When you go to edit it, it will start to make suggestions of, hey, are these actually yours? Um, and so you can see there's a number of different uh, types of information that were gathered together. Some of them are American University United States, American University with no country, and then a number of American universities or the American University with a different country. How many of these are us? I don't know. <laughs> so as we drill into those lists, this is some of what we see. So these are actual uh, affiliations for individual publications that have been published fairly recently. It is possible that one or more of us on the call have one of these publications. <laughs> um, so there's a variety of things happening here if you really look carefully. Um, for example, in that center column, um, we see all of the 2021 publications. There's no spaces between the commas. So it was all submitted as one long text field rather than each individual field of the department and the university being appropriately separated. Um, so that's probably what the mistake was and why this was not attached to American University. Additionally, you can see in all three of these commons, uh, all three of these columns, we don't see anything about Washington, DC. All we get is American University, sometimes United States. Um, and for Scopus, this is not enough information to positively identify it as our university and no one else. <coughs> so why does this happen to AU? And it actually, we think happens to AU more often than probably most institutions. And it's two main reasons. Uh, one is that there's a lot of different ways to say BC. Um, Elaine, was this your slide? <laughs> Sorry, am I talking? <laughs> it might have been, I don't know. Um, why don't you talk about this one? <laughs> okay, so why does this happen to AU so often? Um, well, partially because American University is American University, and also because American University is in Washington, D.C. Um, because American University is, it's rather, uh, we'll say generic, um, and there are many other institutions around the world with American University, American University of Cairo, American University of Beirut, um, et cetera. And then also Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is not a state. It is not always included in like a list of if you are submitting uh, a publication uh, to a publisher, uh, D.C., it, it cannot be considered a state, so it, it messes things up also because of variations in Washington D period, C period. The, they, the algorithms, they can be a little um, finicky. Uh, District of Columbia, et cetera. So I think AU is unique and not necessarily in a great way uh, in that because of these, these two specific things, we have had a, a proliferation of misattributions. Um, additionally, things like Departments and schools 
uh, can confuse things, adding or, you know, leaving out American University or just including, say, College of Arts and Sciences, et cetera, it can, um, it can just throw things off. Rachel, feel free to jump in if there's anything else you want to add. Yeah, and to note, many journals won't even accept an address. So uh, when we're talking about how this mistake happens, it oftentimes is the publisher themselves that is not formatting or making enough data available um, to make a positive match. Sarah's asking if Puerto Rico and Guam have the same issues. It's a great question. I suspect so. Uh, we know AU because that's what we've spent hours looking through the data for. But I think anything where you can have different variations of the name or how they might appear in drop down menus, anyone who has ever lived in DC has tried to fill in the, your address. Sometimes it's D for DC, sometimes it's W for Washington, DC, et cetera. Um, you'll be familiar with those kinds of issues. And I suspect both Puerto Rico and Guam have that issue as well. Um, so anything that's just a little less standardized. All right, so um, we, uh, and Elaine will talk more about our previous project that we did a few years ago, but this came to light uh, a few months ago when the new US News rankings came out. And you guys may remember having an email at some point talking about those rankings and some of the shortcomings of them. Um, the, this year's rankings for the first time include research data, uh, which it didn't below. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, there are a number <laughs> of areas that are not states. So we're not unique, unique in that way, but uh, many other institutions have more distinctive names that also allow them to positively identify a publication as belonging to a specific institution where ours shares a name with other uh, institutions that are not our American University. Anyway, um, so on the right-hand side, I actually pulled out the methodology for how US News factors in um, research into its rankings now. The good news is that all the four categories, and you see those four bullet points, combined uh, to make up 4% of the total score. So the good news is even if our data is not super accurate, it's not uh, weighting heavily towards our final ranking score. Um, but the bad news is that if it's incomplete, we're not giving ourselves all of the research credit we necessarily deserve. Um, one other thing to note, and this is down at the bottom at the right hand side, and this is was a little shocking to us when we discovered it. Um, they have a base threshold of 5,000 publications uh, for a university within the past five years. Any uh, institution that has less than 5,000 publications is, in, it, as it says, is discounted on a sliding scale, meaning the fewer publications you have, the more heavily you're essentially penalized or the lower your research ranking becomes. So our kind of number one goal is to get us as uh, least penalized as possible. Um, one other thing, just because the QS world rankings, some of you may have received an email yesterday asking you to recommend that people fill out the QS world rankings. Uh, this is one, it's another ranking system that's more commonly used outside of the United States. And I, it sounds like AU is taking more of an interest in ensuring <laughs> that our QS ranking is good. They rely much more heavily on research data where it counts for 20% of the score rather than 4%. Um, however, both of these rankings use the same database, which is Scopus. That's what you can see in the orange and the yellow. Um, so that's why we chose to focus on Scopus data to make it as accurate as possible. Um, and this, so this was the information that was sent to us from US News. Um, so you can see we're the top row, and then um, I pulled three comparisons that we actually use in our upcoming reaccreditation um, self study that we identified them as having similar research profiles to AU, um, though obviously not exactly the same. So when you look at the total numbers of papers published, you can see that we're far behind. Right, 2,500 versus 3,700, 4,200, et cetera. We're all below that 5,000 threshold. Um, and, but if you look at the total papers rank, we're all actually fairly similar. I think once you get below 5,000, what's 1,000 between friends? <laughs> it seems like. Um, 
However, when you look at the citations per publication, this is where you really can see um, that discounting on a slided scale at work. So we have the fewest number of papers as compared to the other uh, institutions, which means we were penalized more heavily. So when you look at citations per publication, ours is the highest of the four. But when you get to the next column, citations per publication rank, we are the second lowest because we were more heavily penalized than the ones that were closer to that 5,000 threshold. So you can see Fordham was the other one. They, you know, they had the lowest citation per publication and fewer publications as compared to Southern Methodist and Marquette. Um, but clearly there's some room for improvement here. Uh, again, primarily because we are below, so far below that 5,000 threshold. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Elaine to talk about some uh, more specific mistakes that we discovered and then so I think talk about the project itself that we embarked on. Um, so I guess to back up a little bit, um, we contacted Scopus to see what basically what was going on and we'll talk about this a little bit later. And we were able to get a list from them of uh, potential publications from AU. Um, they had incomplete metadata or bad metadata uh, or something that was excluding them from, um, from being included in our faculty affiliation. So in going through this, um, finding like, we've found all sorts of very interesting mistakes. Um, to go back to the DC uh, lack of specificity, we can find publications that have been affiliated with AU, uh, but have the state of Washington and state of District of Columbia as uh, like in, in the, the publication like specific profile with that faculty member. Or we have um, the publications that have been unaffiliated due to insufficient metadata or some sort of error, whether that's human error or error in um, like the, the algorithm, how things get, you know, processed, submitted, et cetera. Even spacing can make a real difference, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, so a few examples that we've come across. Um, the first one is a publication uh, that was uh, co-authored. Uh, the, the AU faculty member was not actually uh, attributed to the publication. They were left off of it altogether. Uh, so the, uh, the co-author from another university in Boston was uh, attributed to AU mistakenly, uh, which, you know, like that's kind of an interesting example of something bizarre that happened. Um, and then other things that, that have happened that have resulted in uh, publications not being affiliated with AU. Um, I've even seen um, like the, like the American University, we don't see that in like more recent publications, but the American University can make a real difference for whatever reason. So um, we're finding that just being more standardized is, uh, shows that that um, publications uh, will be affiliated with AU more often if, if we can be more standardized. Next slide. Um, so our process, we, um, I think it was Rachel who, who was like, we should take a look at this. Uh, and we reached out to Scopus and were able to get a list of, um, of publications that were probably un were unaffiliated, but maybe were from AU due to some basic metadata in them. Um, and they sent us a list of uh, 2,218 unaffiliated publications uh, from 1930 to 2023. And we reviewed a sample of them. And for, for that uh, spread of years, 92.5% were actually AU affiliated. Um, looking at a smaller scale, uh, the, the the years that cover uh, US News and World Report for 18, 2018 to 2022, 532 publications were published during those that, that span of years. And 95% of those were actually AU affiliated, but had not been attributed to AU. That means that you know, 532 publications were left out in our evaluation in US News and World Report. Um, 300 or 3,116 publications should have been affiliated. Um, after reviewing this, we have definitely re requested that Scopus um, correct this and attribute these publications to AU because it, it does, might not make a huge difference in the grand scheme of things, but it, it, it does make a difference and they have been added to AU's profile. 
Stefan has a question about uh, there is a unique identifier for institutions called the Research Organization Registry or ROAR. And if there's any hopes of that fixing confusion, if all publishers used it, yes. If all authors were aware of it, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but there is, as we said, every publisher has their own method of providing metadata and standardizing metadata. Some of them do use ROAR, and some databases do use ROAR as well. Um, but until everyone is using a similar system and everyone has adopted ROAR, it's not going to necessarily make a meaningful difference. Um, it, uh, and we'll talk about another type of identifier for the author that has, has received greater adoption and is making a difference for being able to uh, correctly identify author affiliation, um, but it requires awareness from the author of what their identifiers are. Um, and that would be probably the best method is having an author input their own, uh, in this case, ROAR or the number that's associated with American University. And so far, I haven't seen a big push for that. So I think it could, but it's not currently. Anyway, um, so yeah, so those missing 532 publications, uh, I went back to the US News rankings and tried to approximate <laughs> where we might have stood. Um, if those 532 papers had been included at the time that US News pulled them. And certainly for next year, those uh, publications will be included. We actually got an email, I believe on Monday, um, saying that they had finished importing all of those records and attributing to them to AU. So they are now properly attributed. Woohoo! Um, so instead of our original, I know, 2584 papers, that last column down at the bottom is our what the revision would look like. So you can see in the very right hand column, our total rank of papers would not have changed that much from 220 to 206, not significant movement. Um, I also pulled the average citations per all of those publications, um, and it rose from 13.8 to 14.9, but I do have an asterisk there because I'm pulling them several months after US News. US News probably pulled these six to nine months ago. And the longer that you have publications around, the more likely they are to have citations. So probably all of those numbers would have risen a bit anyway. So I don't know. And then the algorithm of how much we would have slid in the rankings based on how far below that 5,000 publication threshold we would have been, how it would have impacted that citations per publication rank, don't know. <laughs> because it is both how high your raw citations per publication are, and then how far you slide based on how far below the 5,000 thresholds you are. So that's an algorithm they have not made available to us. Um, but it will be interesting to see how this changes next year. And I'll turn it back to Elaine to talk about future projects. So future projects, first I'm going to give some background. Um, so back in 2019, uh, Rachel and I and a few other librarians in, um, in the library uh, participated in a project called uh, GRID. That's an acronym for the Group to Review and Improve Institutional Data. Um, the purpose of the, the, the project was uh, to review faculty publication uh, to improve the accuracy of AU-affiliated um, publications and faculty information that were submitted to Scopus and potentially other platforms. Uh, so we knew back, back in 2019 that this was an, you know, a, a thing. Um, so we reviewed a sample of AU research outputs uh, from FARS publications to um, correct uh, and identify misattributions of AU faculty affiliations. Uh, and the publications in Scopus, and also to merge duplicate faculty profiles, which were pretty prolific, actually. Um, so the project involved um, identifying and adding uh, to, it, it also involved um, identifying and adding to the AU profile variations and alternate names for AU, AU being fairly generic, people submitting things as, you know, a mayor univ, um, you know, shortened and that sort of thing would exclude them from being sort of uh, uh, put under the umbrella of, of AU uh, publications. So 
in, in that project, we discovered um, in the sample that we reviewed that nearly a third of faculty profiles were either duplicates that split their publications um, across different profiles, which can, of course, impact metrics, um, or that um, faculty affiliations in their profiles needed to be moved to AU, perhaps from another institution where they had started out and it had never been corrected. Um, so it was you know, not in, an, an insignificant number. Um, we did submit uh, profile merge requests and affiliation update requests, and as well as added uh, variant names to AU's profile in Scopus uh, to better capture the publication and faculty affiliations. And so much of this has since been corrected, but there's definitely more work to do. And every year, I think there's there's probably a need to review some of this for you know anything that that ends up falling outside um, the the umbrella of AU and that should be included. Um, so after going through this um, and then seeing what we've seen this year with new U.S. News and World Report, we would like to continue evaluating potential papers for inclusion um, in Scopus, and because um, we've only looked at at a sample. Um, and then we would also are interested in looking at doing a similar process for Web of Science and then other platforms such as um, like the uh, QS World University rankings, uh, which definitely, as Rachel uh, said earlier, 20% uh, of their uh, like evaluation comes from publication information. So I think there's, there's potential for real impact there. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been talking about moving forward with, but it's uh, it's definitely in the weeds work that requires um, a, a real attention to detail and uh, you know care about things like spacing and punctuation and uh, periods and that sort of thing. And the other good news, um, the, the 2200 publications that were sent to us from Scopus, uh, when we talked with Scopus about the issues we're having, they actually went and reviewed their algorithm of once we get a publication, how it is automatically determined to belong to AU. Those 2,200 records were ones that they uh, were considering to automatically add. Um, so once we determined, yes, the vast majority of those are AU publications, they fixed their algorithm. So moving forward, uh, publications with similar metadata to the ones that we reviewed will automatically be added to our profile. So as we continue to evaluate uh, our Scopus records in the future, we shouldn't have anything that's quite as large as the, the sample re we reviewed. Um, that said, there does have to be some kind of data that says American University in order for it to be included. And we'll talk about this later, but if only a name is included and there's no um, institution associated with it, uh, it can never be added to AU's profile. Even if we say, I know that this professor was at AU when they wrote that publication and should be attributed to us because it didn't have American University in the, the record, they will never add it to our profile. So there at least it needs to be enough American University uh, in the record itself for us to, to get into the review queue if it isn't automatically included. All right. Um, so, you may have noticed when we were talking about the GRID project, uh, we mainly focused on author profiles. At the time, we assumed that correctly attributing an author profile with the correct institution would mean all of their papers were then correctly attributed, right? So if we say, yes, this professor was working for us, therefore his papers should be attributed, it turns out that author profiles are entirely separate from an institutional profile. <laughs> so all of the work that we did made author profiles more accurate. But it did not, by and large, change uh, the number of records that 2584. Um, we did do some work, as Elaine said, to clean up the variance. So the 2584 was higher than it would have been if we had not done that project. <laughs> um, but we've since learned that author profiles are something that are important to researchers to look at, but won't affect institutional rankings. So that's why we have two different sections um of this uh, presentation uh, melissa is asking how many publications have not been attributed to au because the university's name is missing and can never be attributed to us i love this question melissa because it's one that elaine and i have asked ourselves as well we've come across some just uh, as i'm helping researchers i help people with their tenure files 
um, and end up looking up these kinds of profiles. And sometimes I will notice, ah, this was not actually included uh, because AU was not mentioned uh, in this publication. Otherwise, other than searching for individual researchers that way, we have no way of identifying them. So this is a big unknown, and I, I wish that we could do a study on this. Okay, so we're going to now talk about author profiles, or essentially how authors can manage their own outputs to make sure that they're all collected under the same person correctly. So as I mentioned, totally separate from university affili affiliation, not going to improve the rankings. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the major places where author profiles exist um, within a narrow confine. Um, so I'm not going to talk about private academic networks, most notably ResearchGate and academia.edu. Um, those tend to be ones that you select your publications and add to them. Um, but we're talking more about the library um, databases uh, with one major exception, Google Scholar. Um, this is the one that I usually talk about the first when I talk about how can I ensure that I as a researcher have an accurate publication record that's available somewhere and someone can look at it. Um, Google Scholar of the available tools is the most complete. It's also the one that you have the most control over it to the extent that there is no automatic author profiles that are created. Um, so in the other systems we'll look at, author profiles are automatically generated based on the publication data. In Google Scholar, you have to go in and create an author profile. Otherwise, one won't exist. So. I've shown you the example of mine, um, and at the bottom is the site, the URL where you can go and start creating your own, but anyone who's a researcher with at least one publication, I cannot recommend this highly enough. Um, because sometimes people will be interested in you as a researcher, rather than in a single publication of yours, and they'll want to know about your publication record or history. This is your best opportunity to make that publicly available and complete. Um, <clears throat> so once you sign up for Google Scholar, it's going to look for your name and it's going to start suggesting articles that it thinks belong to you. And you just click, yes, this is mine, yes, this is mine, and it's going to get added to your Google Scholar profile. Note that this is definitely dependent on a high degree of trust for people to accurately select their own publications, because it will include anything that you say is yours. <laughs> so, uh, you know, be ethical when you're doing this. Um, and anytime it thinks it has a new match, um, it can either automatically add it for you or send you an email to have you review it. And I recommend the second just to make sure there isn't someone else with somewhat very similar name that's publishing uh, articles that are not you. Um, but you can do some other uh, manipulation. Um, for example, uh, my very first article, they got my last name wrong. <laughs> and so some of the citations have an incorrect version of my last name. Um, so when we're tracking uh, time cited, it was creating a whole different version of my article than the official record. And it was corrected, but there's like essentially two versions of my article that got cited. I can take both of those versions and combine them in Google Scholar to get one final count. Um, and if you look at my record, that third one down, do you see that there's an asterisk next to 64? That indicates that there's two or more separate different versions of my article that I've combined together into one record. So things like an incorrect page number, right? Um, the year got wonky. There's a thousand ways in which people cite things in a slightly wrong way. Again, humans <laughs> are not always accurate. Um, so you can correct that in Google Scholar. Um, and you can also add articles yourself. So you can see I open that drop down and add article manually is an option. So if you want people to know about a publication you had, even if Google Scholar doesn't index it, you can at least put the information about that publication and it will be in your record. You can add a URL so that people can access it. All right, um, so moving on to a Scopus profile. As I mentioned, these are auto-generated based on the information from individual publications. <clears throat> um, and it doesn't always get it right. So this is an example that we found in Scopus of someone who has five different records. 
I will say, uh, the more generic a name is, the more likely it is that this will happen. This doesn't happen to me because my name is much more unique. <laughs> um, but you can see eight documents have been attributed to that main author profile. And then we have four separate publications underneath it that each didn't match in some slightly different way. I haven't looked at these to know what they are, but they created different authors. The good news is that, um, well, one we've talked about, so isn't going to change US news rate rankings. Um, <clears throat> but we can make changes to it. Um, so if you are someone who's in Scopus and you've noticed you have more than one profile, you can request to merge those profiles. Um, you just click on the profiles and up at the top it says merge. <laughs> That's it. It'll place a request to do that, just like we did with the grid project. You can edit your individual profile. You can see on the right. <clears throat> And then you can add ORCID, which we'll talk about in a second. I'm going to start to speed up because we only have 10 minutes left. Who knew? <clears throat> Web of Science is one of the other places that has a profile. Um, and again, you can actually see at the top, this is an algorithmically generated author record. So they're taking all of that data and making their best guess. I have found that Web of Science does not do nearly as great a job um, in that it will take multiple people. Uh, for example, Gray J A M and Gray J A Muir are not the same person as Gray James A. Um, so, Web of Science really takes a loosey goosey approach. If you look at your record and your name is at all common, you will probably find mistakes in it. So, in that case, you would want to go to claim my record. You do need to have a Web of Science uh, account, which is free to register. They don't email you or use it for any information that I can tell. Um, other than tracking what you do in Web of Science when you're logged in. Um, but once you are, have claimed your record, you can clean it up. <clears throat> Here, you can merge the records. And actually, I do have two separate records, one with my peer reviews, which is in a separate system, and one with my publications. But they didn't know it was the same person. So even, um, even in Web of Science with uh, less unique names, you can get more than one profile. Um, so you can both delete publications and add additional publications that weren't originally attributed to your author record. Now, probably <laughs> the most important thing that I should have led with when talking about author profiles is that um, there is a unique number that's available to you to identify you from all of the other people, especially if you have a very common name. I like to invoke my husband, Adam Smith who, if he was a publisher, would have tremendous difficulty tracking his publications because it's a very common name. When you um, apply for an ORCID, it gives you a unique number that you can attach to your publications. Many journals will make you or require you to have an ORCID so that they can uh, um, attribute you properly. Um, most of the databases do use ORCIDs when they can get them, but when you have an ORCID, um, it really helps you track your publications as it moves from one system to another. Um, <clears throat> so once you've logged into ORCID, you can add all of your publications, but you can also import publications from Scopus, from Web of Science, not Google Scholar, I don't think, but you can create a connection. Um, so essentially having an ORCID makes your all of the information across different systems more accurate but mostly what it does is it makes your or ORCID profile uh, more accurate. So they will check for an ORCID when they're adding new publications, but if you add something to your ORCID record, it's not going to then add it to Scopus or Web of Science if it wouldn't otherwise be in ORCID or, uh, Scopus or Web of Science. Um, <clears throat> the other main benefit of ORCID is that when you need to create, to present your publication information, say for a grant, if you are applying for an NSF grant, for example, they now more or less require you to have an ORCID so that you can easily import all of your information rather than having to type it into their system. Um, so it really enables you to take your publications and throw it places. <laughs> ORCID is in lots of different systems. Elements, the faculty activity reporting system that we talked about earlier, also uses ORCID. Um, so this is my other very high recommendation if you are someone who wants to make sure that your uh, the information that you are presenting about yourself is accurate and consistent. ORCID helps you do that. Um, <laughs> also, 
many journals will create auto create an orchid for you if you don't I give them one. Um, we were reviewing list of orchid numbers that are associated with AU and this is just one example and I hate to pick on this person, but it was kind of striking they have at least 10 different orchid numbers because they haven't claimed one as their own and started creating that profile and giving it to publishers. So this is the downside of not claiming an orchid. And I'm going to turn it back to Elaine to finish us up. Yeah. So just some quick recommendations. Um, uh, going back to like our uh, variations in affiliation statements, uh, in reviewing uh, faculty publications between 2018 and uh, 2024, there were 950 variations overall out of uh, more than 4,000 publications. So, um, and 169 of these al alone started with American University. So there are, you know, any way under the sun to um, to affiliate yourself in publication statements with AU. Um, so we would really recommend trying to be as standard and specific as possible. Um, adding in your name, American University as a, as a baseline, uh, Washington DC 20016, the, the zip code does seem to help. Um, also punctuation spacing and capitalization can make a difference. We do see variations that, that make a difference where there's a period added or no period added or a comma or a space. And the American University, um, although, again, like I said earlier, uh, we see less of that now, but um, a, a good number of the unaffiliated publications that we reviewed had the American University. And so I think there's there's something in there that, that throws things off. Um, bottom line is that there is only so much that can be done, but trying to be as consistent as possible will help. Again, a lot of it depends on uh, the publisher where you're submitting information um, because they, they may not accept an address, for example, but if you can submit an address, um, adding in you know, a consistent line um, uh, and the, the zip code will help. Um, if there is some institutional affiliation, uh, we can correct the errors, but we can't add an institution on your behalf. Going back to the, the question that Melissa asked earlier, something that, that says this is an AU person, this is AU, um, will enable us to, to say yes, it, like let's take it. Um, and when in doubt, ask us. Um, ask a librarian, but you can also just reach out to Rachel or me. Um, we're, we're happy to try to help. And with that, we have a whole two minutes. Um, we've been kind of answering questions as they came up, but uh, if people have additional questions, um, I would also say feel free to ask any library contact you have. If they don't know, they'll probably direct you to us. Um, so now is the time for all of the questions you've been dying to ask. <laughs> if there aren't questions, then I think I will stop my share and turn it back over to CTRL. Okay, um, I'm going to take over now, Lynn. Um, I just dropped the link to our um, survey. If you guys could just go there, I'm also sharing the I'm also sharing the QR code here. There you go. Thank you so much for joining again, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, please take a moment. You can scan the survey, and I also just dropped the link to the survey in our chat, so if you could click on that and uh, answer the questions really quickly, that would be great. I will be ending the meeting here. Thank you, everyone.